welcome everyone for the IMSC 60 Distinguished Lecture Series. And today it's a great pleasure. We have Professor V. Arvind as our speaker. He was a former director and uh, he has kindly agreed to give a talk. So before we begin, I would request Professor Venkatesh Raman to introduce him. Hi. Um, so Arvind requires no introduction to this audience or to the audience doing computational complexity theory, but for the benefit of those who may be joining in YouTube, let me, I'll introduce him. Arvind did his um, PhD uh, in computer science from IIT Kanpur, one of the early uh, complexity theorists in the country. Um, after a brief uh, stint at IIT Madras and, at, and a few years at IIT Delhi as a faculty in the computer science departments, Arvind joined in uh, 1993 at uh, IMSC. His area of interest uh, uh, is broadly computational complexity theory, uh, more specifically algebraic and randomized computation. Um, he serves as an associate editor of the ACM's Transactions on Computation Theory Journal and is also an editor of the Computational Complexity column of the Bulletin of the European Association of Theoretical Computer Science. And today he's going to talk about uh, an area, a problem which is very close to his heart where he has worked in a lot of, lot of years and written a lot of papers uh, that's on graph isomorphism. Thank you, Venkatesh, for your kind introduction. And uh, I thank the committee running this wonderful series of seminars and the director for inviting me and giving me a chance to speak in this series of lectures. Uh, so today's talk is the story of one problem, which is called the graph isomorphism problem. And uh, let's get started. Uh, so here is the plan of the talk. I'll begin with an overview and uh, some history. And then I'll talk about what is called the Weiss-Feiler Lehman procedure, which is essentially uh, rudimentarily its vertex classification. And then there are higher dimensional versions of it. And uh, what the role that it plays in graph isomorphism. And then a little bit of group theory, because group theory plays an essential role in uh, algorithms for graph isomorphism, um, a bit of permutation group theory. And then I'll just mention some graph isomorphism algorithms. And uh, finally, talk about some connections to machine learning, which is a new feature. Again, I'll only be briefly able to touch on many of these things. Uh, but let's see as we go along how much time we have. And uh, so here is the problem itself. Uh, so these are two graphs. So what is a graph? A graph is uh, not uh, not the plotting of a curve, but uh, it's points and lines between points. So the first graph on the left, which is G, has eight points or eight vertices. And certain pairs of these vertices are connected by a line, which is called an undirected edge. So you have vertices and edges. So the first graph G has eight vertices and a bunch of edges, uh, eight, uh, so 12 edges. And similarly, the second graph H, which also has eight vertices and has uh, 12 edges. Eight uh, circularly around that one eight cycle that is there, and then opposite pairs of vertices are joined by an edge. The point in the middle is not a vertex, it's just because that's the only way you can draw it. Okay. <clears throat> it turns out that these two graphs are isomorphic. What does that mean? It means that you can rename A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, so that the two graphs become identical. And this gives the renaming. The mapping phi tells you how to rename A, B, C, D. So A maps to 1, B maps to 2, and so on. If you do that, then you will see that 1 is adjacent to uh, 5, 8, and 2, and, and in phi of g also 1 is adjacent to 5, 8, and 2, and so on. So these two graphs are isomorphic. So given two graphs in general, they could be on n vertices, where 
n could be any number and the two graphs are given as input uh, for an algorithm and uh, the graph is given as input by usually by a list of edges all unordered pairs of vertices which form an edge for example for g it would be a list of all these 12 edges a comma b a comma d and so on and given two such graphs on n vertices each the problem is to check if there is a renaming of the vertices that is a permutation a bijection from the vertex set of the first to the vertex set of the second which preserves all the adjacencies edges go to edges and non edges go to non edges so this is the graph isomorphism problem <clears throat> and it's been of interest to uh, in theoretical computer science at least and uh, a lot of people who do programming and are are interested in designing algorithms since the early 1960s but the history goes even further back so the bottom line is the definition of an isomorphism uh, okay going to the history so here is a, a quick history of the problem it starts with chemistry actually the need to organize chemical compounds and uh, in fact the first chemical dictionaries uh, were published in the early 191800s in germany where it's basically uh, the dictionary consists of different molecules and a brief description of each molecule so that you can quickly look up the dictionary and see whether uh, such a molecule that you're looking for exists or you need to uh, create it yourself or what you've created whether it's already discovered and so on so all these things in order to do that you need a dictionary and uh, this became more and more difficult and challenging as the number of molecules that were discovered increased exponentially with and uh, with time in the last two centuries for example in the springer uh, bilstein's handbook of organic chemistry it's a dictionary of 500 volumes of uh, chemical volumes you know chemical uh, molecules and there is also the american chemical society's chemical abstract services which was first created in 1907 and now today we have enormous chemical databases of all the molecules that have been discovered and uh, cataloged basically since the mid 19th century people also started representing chemical compounds as structural formulas they realized that it was it, they wanted to abstract out the jumble of um, atoms and bonds and so on into just the overall structure what is the underlying structure of the molecule so and these were called structural formulas um and in the 1940s and 50s going forward by nearly 100 years and there is a rapid increase in the discovery of new compounds with commercial use and the patent office in the US and european countries were facing the problem of comparing a new compound with existing ones but the total number of existing molecules is enormous so you naturally need computers to do that check okay so and this basically gave birth to the field of chemoinformatics i think there are other aspects to computational chemistry but this is somehow called chemoinformatics and in 1948 uh so called gkd chemical cipher was developed i have forgotten the names of the three characters the uh, gordon kendall and somebody um, to represent a molecular structure as as a string so that it's easily amenable to database search so you are looking for you want to know whether this molecule is already there in the database you have a database of strings so you take this molecule and you want to do a search well you represent it as a string which is the representation used for different molecules and you search in the database but the solutions were not satisfactory and the main challenge there was to get a representation for a molecular structure as a string that was a diff- invariant under different orientations of the molecule because i mean you it depends on how you structure a molecule as a string which atom do you place as the first and which do you place as the second and so the same molecule can look different if it's you know if it's ordered differently so to speak 
so to to combat that difficulty uh, to take the you know s uh, spatial orientation of molecules certain objects called topological ciphers were developed there's something called the morgan fingerprint apparently it's still used to search chemical databases and uh, finally chemistry meant graph theory uh, a russian chemist by name vladut he was a pioneer in using graph theory to model chemical compounds and and study uh, molecular structures basically structural formulas were already in graphs so it was conceived of even earlier but he was the one who first started thinking of you know representing uh, molecules as graphs and his work inspired these two people who are kind of important in our story weisfeiler and lehman to invent what we will call the weisfeiler lehman procedure for graph isomorphism and so this was some time in the 60s 1960s um <clears throat> and it's also interesting to note that the term graph that was first used in graph theory was introduced as a model of molecules by silvester and there is an 1878 nature article titled chemistry and algebra so uh, so i found this an interesting thing to note that silvester was the first one who 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 kind of abstracted away chemistry and algebra and saw some commonality there it's a short note it's just one and a half pages long where he's talking about uh, terminology and things like that okay coming back to the graph isomorphism problem <clears throat> so clearly what we have here is a graph isomorphism problem because i have a molecule and i have a database and i want to know if this molecule is present in the database in some reordered manner so i want to discover a canonical representation for my molecule as a string and in the database i'll have canonical representations for all the discovered molecules and then i can just do a simple search in the database question is how do i find a canonical representation for a molecule okay so that if you want to represent it as strings you can think of it as a graph canonization problem if you can canonically represent a graph then you can check if two graphs are isomorphic because you will just find the canonical representations of both and check if they are equal because if it's a if it's a complete canonical representation it will be a complete invariant the object that you compute and you will know that uh, equality means that the graphs are isomorphic of course you still have to recover an isomorphism between the two graphs that can also be done okay so coming back to the graph isomorphism problem i just want in one slide to give you a quick snapshot of uh, certain highlights so it's not known to be in polynomial time and it's unlikely to be np complete so from a computer science theory computer science point of view efficient means polynomial time algorithms so in the case of graph isomorphism i have n vertex graphs i want an algorithm that runs in n to the power some constant which will check if two graphs are isomorphic and um, np complete problems are those that seem to defy any polynomial time uh, strategy so and uh, the only evidence for it is uh, empirical and we go on the hypothesis that polynomial time is different from np complete and so this is one of the few problems that has not yet been classified as polynomial time or np complete um there are polynomial time algorithms for many interesting graph classes one of them is bounded degree graphs uh due to eugene lux the other is bounded eigen value multiplicity graphs which means that you take this undirected graph and you take its adjacency matrix it's a symmetric matrix because you put a one in the ijth entry if there's an edge between i and j and there's also an edge between j and i because the edges are undirected so you get a symmetric matrix of zeros and ones its eigen values are all real and you want to know if every eigen value occurs with multiplicity bounded by a constant and if that is the case then you have an algorithm with running time n to the power that bound on the eigen value multiplicity bounded genus graphs are graphs that are embeddable in bounded genus surfaces they also have efficient algorithms the first and second are algorithms are group theoretic in nature the bounded genus one is more combinatorial bounded tree width graphs are 
are graphs that look like trees when you squeeze them into little bags of size uh, some constant that bound is that constant and then you can shape them like trees and uh, for bounded tree with graphs again by a combinatorial algorithm somebody called Bordlander found an algorithm excluded topological minors so jumping forward uh, it's a more recent relatively more recent result topological minors I won't describe for you <clears throat> and then parameterized complexity bounds I just wanted to mention a bunch of interesting results by our own Saket along with co-authors uh, for bounded tree bit graphs for example they they were the first ones to find a fixed parameter algorithm where the parameter is the tree width of the graphs and also for excluded minor graphs a more recent result which is a very beautiful result by Saket and his collaborators and uh, very recently for general graphs uh, Babai in a tour de force of more than 100 pages uh, gave a 2 to the order log in cube time algorithm for graph isomorphism I will very briefly tell you, so it, uh, the, the last item in the slide, Baba's algorithm builds on the first item uh, due to Eugene Lux. Both are essentially group theoretic algorithms. Both use permutation group structure in a very s significant way. The, the path was opened by Lux when he, when he figured out how to divide and conquer groups. And Baba took it to its extreme limit and uh, but with the, st the polynomial time bound still eludes us. That's still open. So there's a quick summary. And now I'll go back to the Weisfeiler Lehman algorithms because that is a big part of my story. So let me start with describing the one dimensional Weisfeiler Lehman procedure <clears throat> because there are higher dimensional versions of it. Uh, it's, it's also called naive vertex classification and color refinement. Uh, so what is the idea? You are given a graph and you iteratively color the vertices as follows. To begin with, every vertex gets the same color. In the next round, if u and v are vertices of the same color, you look at the neighbors of u and see how many neighbors are colored red. If there are five that are colored red, then you, then you tag five comma red. And if there are ten that are colored blue, you tag ten comma blue. So you have a whole list of number of vertices of different uh, different colors which are neighbors of you that tuple becomes and uh, the new color of the vertex u basically the color refinement refines the color of the vertex u by its own color and the colors of all the neighbors the multi set of the colors of all the neighbors of that vertex so that i have written down as the color the in the i plus first stage the color of the vertex u is the color of the vertex u in the ith stage paired with the multiset of the colors of all its neighbors in the ith stage. And after each round, because these colors are becoming big tuples, you just look at, there are, you don't need more than n colors anyway because there are only n vertices in the graph. So you look at, look at all of them and rename all the tuples as red, blue, green and so on or 1, 2, 3 and so on. Okay? So sort the colors and replace them by numbers. And finally, when there is no refinement of the color classes, you stop the procedure. So that is the one-dimensional uh, weisfeiler lehmann procedure, very simple idea. So here, for example, is a seven-vertex graph. And to begin with, you color them all the same. And the next round, you color it the way, way I explained. Look at how many neighbors each vertex has. So A has two neighbors and G also has two neighbors, so both get the color one. C also has two neighbors. Whereas E has five neighbors, so it's the only one that get, gets the color four, and so on. So in the next round, you find that all seven of them get different colors. So there's no further scope for refinement. Okay. So in fact, this actually produces a canonical form for the graph, because every vertex gets labeled by a different color. Another graph that is going to be isomorphic to this will also produce a similar labeling and you can just compare the canonical labelings to see that the two graphs are isomorphic or not. So this is a very special case. Okay. So the final partition which cannot be refined further is called the, the stable partition of G or the 
it's also sometimes called the coarsest equitable partition of G if you if, to get into technical details. But this particular graph is an example of a discrete graph. A discrete graph is a very desirable graph because with the one dimensional Weisweller Lehman procedure, all the vertices get distinct labels. So for such a graph, testing isomorphism is very easy. Because you will you will if you have one discrete graph, you do the same for the other graph. If that is not discrete, then you know that they are not isomorphic. If the if the stable color partition has sizes more than one. If it has sizes one, then you just compare the colors and that has to give you an isomorphism. Otherwise they are not isomorphic. And the nice thing is, okay, for discrete graph it computes a canonical labeling, as I just explained to you. And the nice thing is that if you take a random graph in the erdos Rennie model of random graphs, namely if you have an n vertex graph, every edge you put with probability one half. And you get a probability distribution, uniform probability distribution over all n vertex undirected graphs. Then with probability tending to one, every graph is a discrete graph. So that means as a consequence, it was, uh, it, um, the years are a little off here, um, but I think the final paper of Baba Eridish Seklo, it shows uh, uh, better bounds than what is required for the second result, the Babai Kuchera result. The graph isomorphism therefore is soluble very efficiently on the average case. By average case, I mean the uniform distribution on all, all graphs. I mean, it's, there could be more sophisticated dis distributions against which we don't know good algorithms. But for the uniform distribution, this gives a very good algorithm. It also means that if you give me a random graph, then it's very easy to solve graph isomorphism. It's interesting to contrast that with a problem like integer factoring. The, the amazing thing about integer factoring is that you pick two random, large random prime numbers and you multiply them and you don't know how to factor it. Whereas for graph isomorphism, a random graph is very easy to test for isomorphism because of this, with high probability. Um, <clears throat> One dimensional Weisweiler Lehman underlies many different, for example, for trees, if you give me two trees, one dimensional Weisweiler Lehman will succeed uh, on trees. And uh, many other classes of graphs, it just succeeds. Okay, you can even find out which classes of graphs it works uh, for. Um, and in general, uh, there is something called the K dimensional Weisweiler Lehman where you don't just color vertices, but you look at pairs of vertices or k tuples of vertices. The philosophy is that you locally look at k subsets of things, you color them, and then you propagate the colors by some kind of message passing. Because two things which are which can talk to each other through edges, you it kind of seeps through to the others, and gradually it fills the entire graph. So that is essentially k-dimensional Weisweiler Lehman. And for a long time, um, the, the best algorithm for graph isomorphism had running time 2 to the power square root of n log n. Uh, that was due to Babai and Lux in 1982, soon after the bounded degree graph isomorphism algorithm. And that uses the one dimensional procedure as an essential part of it. It's a combination of some permutation group theory and uh, the Weisweiler Lehman procedure. Uh, I won't be able to get into details, uh, but it's easy to read up and understand if you're interested. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about for which graphs can we use one dimensional Weisweiler Lehman to solve graph isomorphism. So you say that two graphs G and H are indistinguishable if you can't tell them apart using Weisweiler Lehman by using one dimensional Weisweiler Lehman. WL stands for Weisweiler Lehman. You can't tell them apart. That means the color partitions are the same. Five red vertices here, five red vertices here. 10 blue vertices here, 10 blue vertices here. So the, you get the same multisets. You can't tell them apart. Consider the following isomorphism test. <coughs> if you're given two graphs, G and H, you just run one dimensional Weisweiler Lehman and if they, if it can't tell the difference between G and H, you output isomorphic, otherwise output non-isomorphic. So for example, take these two graphs. Uh, this is the first round of coloring because 
the blue ones are the degree 2 ones and the red ones are the degree 3 ones and in the next round you can see the difference because 2 is the only vertex adjacent which is degree 2 and adjacent to both the degree 3 vertices. So one dimensional vice Euler layman can tell them apart. Uh, it does not distinguish between G and H because in this case because they are really isomorphic, it is the same graph. I just put one triangle inside the other triangle. And here, these two graphs are clearly not isomorphic because the second one is a 6 cycle, the first one is two disjoint 3 cycles, but it can't tell them apart because both these are two regular graphs. If you have a regular graph, Weisfeiler Lehman cannot do anything because it cannot uh, refine the partition any further because all it uses is how many neighbors are there of uh, whatever color and so it will never refine the original graph at all. So it cannot tell apart these two graphs though one of them is disconnected and with the eye we can tell them apart. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so here is another example uh, of uh, two graphs which are connected but also non-isomorphic but it can't tell them apart. Fine, I think I and then a little bit more about one dimensional weiss feiler layman it, it's always correct for discrete graphs, it's very efficient, it's always correct on isomorphic graphs because these are partial invariants anyway. So what the one dimensional weiss feiler layman computes, it's a partial invariant. It's a complete invariant for discrete graphs. And uh, for example, for non-isomorphic regular graphs, it's always incorrect, but it's also incorrect on many other pairs of graphs. <clears throat> There's something mathematically very nice about one dimensional weiss feiler layman I just wanted to tell you that as well because it's, it just gives you a very beautiful picture here. So you say that two graphs are fractionally isomorphic if A and B are the adjacency matrices of the two graphs G and H. So remember A and B are symmetric n by n matrices if G and H are n vertex graphs where you put an edge, you put a 1 in the ijth entry if if i and j are adjacent, so you'll have a 1 in the j i th entry also, you put zeros elsewhere. And um, if there is a permutation matrix P says that A P equals P A, P B, then A and B are isomorphic. I should have written P and not X. And on the other hand, if you relax it and say that I only want X to be a doubly stochastic matrix, I don't care whether it's a permutation matrix or not. I drop the integrality constraint from X. Then you say that G and H are fractionally isomorphic. If for a doubly stochastic matrix X, doubly stochastic means non-negative entries, the row sums are 1 and the column sums are 1. So uh, the columns look like probability distributions if you will, and the rows also look like probability distributions. And we know by the uh, by Birkhoff's theorem that uh, the doubly stochastic matrices form a very nice convex body with extreme points as all the n factorial permutation matrices. So um, asking if the two graphs are isomorphic is asking if there is an extreme point in this polytope uh, x says that Ax equals xb, x is going to be a permutation matrix in that case. If you drop the extremality constraint, the integrality constraint, then you say they are fractionally isomorphic. There is a beautiful theorem that says that G and H are indistinguishable by one dimensional weiss feiler layman sorry. CR means, the CR there stands for color refinement. It also means one dimensional weiss feiler layman So two graphs are indistinguishable by one dimensional weiss feiler layman if and only if they are fractionally isomorphic. So, so there's this interesting connection between what one dimensional weiss feiler layman can do, well it's limited to what fractional isomorphisms can do whereas we are inter interested in integral isomorphisms. And there is even a logical connection that makes it even more interesting. So suppose you want to describe a graph G logically. So you will say, uh, if you want to write down a first order formula, you will say there exists X and Y, says that X and Y are adjacent and so on. You will build a first order formula with quantifiers and variables. and the edges will be your predicates. You can also use predicates like x equal to y and so on. But suppose you are allowed to use only two variables, but you can reuse the variables because when you have a bound variable inside, 
I can reintroduce the variable again and use it as a free variable and bind it again outside. But if I don't need more than two variables and I build a first order formula, it turns out that a graph is describable completely by a first order formula using two variables precisely when uh, the, uh, that uh, so two graphs are indistinguishable by some first order formula by sentences by all sentences in first order logic with two variables but I need counting quantifiers also I need because I count no I ask are there five neighbors that are red when I do color refinement so I need counting quantifiers that is precisely when the two graphs are indistinguishable by one dimensional vice valor lemma. So there is this three way interesting connection. Uh, one dimensional vice valor lemma, indistinguishability of two graphs, fractional isomorphism of the two graphs, and equivalence under two variable first order formulas uh, with counting quantifiers. Okay. So when we have a three way equivalence, it's a pleasing thing to see. So let me just tell you a few things about higher dimensional Weiss-Weller Lehman. So two dimensional Weiss-Weller Lehman is where you start where you start coloring pairs of vertices. So big, to begin with all edges will be colored red and all non edges will be colored in blue. And then if you have a red edge followed by a, a blue which means a non edge the pair of vertices will be colored green let us say and so on. So you will refine pairs of vertices instead of singletons. So you are allowing basically more information to propagate. And it's strictly, you can prove it's stronger than one dimensional vice viral lemma. So in fact, it can determine if two graphs are co-spectral. And if two graphs are not co-spectral, it can tell them apart. So for example, if you take two disjoint triangles and a six cycle, it can tell them apart because uh, the eigenvalue two occurs with multiplicity two in the two disjoint triangles case whereas the other one is connected and it occurs with multiplicity one. So it can tell up, tell apart, so you can see it's stronger than one dimensional vice versa lemma. On the other hand, <clears throat> it's also not good enough. And uh, the counter examples are very nice objects called strongly regular graphs. And uh, the smallest counter examples to two dimensional vice versa lemma, I wanted to mention it also because there is a Shrikhande connection to it uh, closer home. Um, these are, so what are strongly regular graphs? 16, 6, 2, 2 means that it's a 16 vertex graph. These two graphs are 16 vertex graphs. Every vertex has six neighbors, so it's a six regular graph. Okay, every vertex has six neighbors. The two, the first two means that any two adjacent weight vertices have two common neighbors. So if u and v are adjacent, there are exactly two vertices that are adjacent to both u and v. And the second two means that for every two non-adjacent weight vertices, there are two common neighbors. So in general, an n k lambda mu strongly regular graph means it's an n vertex graph, which is k regular, such that any two adjacent vertices have lambda common neighbors, and any two non-adjacent vertices have mu common neighbors. And uh, these graphs are very interesting because you can completely classify them. They have only three distinct eigenvalues and have many other nice properties. And they are resistant to two-dimensional vice valor lemma. If you have two strongly regular graphs with the same parameters, two-dimensional vice valor lemma cannot tell them apart. And uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to say something on the positive side. I'll come back to the Shrikhande example in a minute. On the positive side, as I mentioned in the initial summary of algorithms for graph isomorphism, if you take any class of graphs with a forbidden minor, for example, if you take planar graphs, it has two forbidden minors, k33 and k5. Um, if you take any class of graphs with a single forbidden minor, there is a constant case as that k-dimensional vice viral layman can tell these two graphs, uh, can, can tell this graph apart from any other graph that's non-isomorphic to this. But the, the constant k could be much larger than the size of the forbidden minor in Grohe's algorithm. On the other hand, uh, there, is a, there is a, in the case of planar graphs, it's been shown that three-dimensional Weiss-Feiler-Lehman is enough to identify all planar graphs. 
and finally the killer which uh, kind of says that Weisfeil-Lehman can never be enough to solve graph isomorphism is the theorem due to Tsai, Führer and Immerman that there is an infinite family of degree 3 graphs which will require uh, k-dimensional Weisfeil-Lehman to have k order of n if or to, to identify n vertex graphs. Okay. So there is a c construction of such a family of graphs due to these people. The interesting thing again is that this construction of this family of graphs is also logically motivated. So there is a connection, a logical connection here as well. I just wanted to show you uh, uh, the Shrikhande and the Rook graphs uh, which I picked from Wikipedia because the one on the left uh, very beautifully drawn with 16 vertices is the Shrikhande graph and the one on the right is the Rook's graph, 4 by 4 Rook's graph. The Rook's graph is all positions where you can place, the edges means that the Rook's uh, you know, can take each other so you can't put them on those places. They are non-isomorphic. You can see that because in the Shrikhande graph, the neighbor of every vertex is a six cycle, whereas in the Rooks graph, the neighbor of every vertex is a two disjoint triangles. You can check that. Too. Okay, so moving on. So because the Sy Führer Immerman uh, result put paid to Weisfeiler Lehman alone as a strategy, we need some group theory. And that was discovered long ago because People are looking for algorithms and they, they found out that they can use some group theory, which actually comes in naturally because if you give me two n vertex graphs um, and pi is a bijection from V to V prime, um, what does it mean? It means UV is an edge if and only if pi, U pi, V pi is an edge. U pi means that pi applied to you, uh, the image of pi. So pi is a bijection from V to V prime. So such that edges go to edges and non-edges to non-edges and automorphisms of a graph are isomorphisms from G to itself and they form a group because two automorphisms obviously uh, will combine together in, in the obvious sense and when you compose them that will also be an automorphism and they form the subgroup odd G of the symmetric group on 1 to n. If the vertex set V is 1 to n then odd G is going to be a subgroup of the symmetric group uh, on, on these n vertices. And the nice thing is that the set of all solutions to the graph isomorphism problem is just a right coset of odd g. Uh, you can think of it as odd g pi. Of course, uh, it is not a coset sitting inside Sn, but if you think of V prime also as 1 to n, then it is a coset sitting inside Sn. So all the solutions come bundled as a nice coset. So it gives us the confidence that we can somehow lay our hands on it. Unlike other combinatorial NP hard problem, I mean, NP complete problems where solutions don't have any structure where you can put them nicely together. <coughs> um, so here are some facts. No algorithm essentially faster than n factorial is known that does not use some group theory. So there is even a two power order n algorithm which doesn't use group theory and is only combinatorial for general graphs is not known. And Baba's algorithm is, of course uses a lot of group theory. And uh, many special cases like bounded de degree graphs, tournaments, the only known algorithms are group theoretic in nature. And uh, how do you use group theory? You divide and conquer groups. So this could be like a very basic for many of you. So you know what, uh, uh, how a permutation group uh, a subgroup G of Sn acts on the domain 1 to n, it partitions them into orbits. Orbits uh, i and g, j are in the same orbit if there is an element of the group that can send i to j. And G sub i is on the other hand the subgroup of G that fixes the vertex i, all G and G that map i to i. And of course Lagrange's theorem tells you that the number of distinct cosets is just the size of the orbit for, for the vertex i. So you have all these orbits and you know where they come from. They come from, they are kind of identifiable with the cosets of uh, these fixed point subgroups, point stabilizer subgroups. And G is called transitive 
if there is exactly one orbit. So divide and conquer in algorithms means you have given a problem instance, you break it into two parts in a nice way so that when you solve this part and this part, you can nicely combine the two solutions to get a solution for the whole. And so orbits kind of tell you that you can break up a group into orbits, try to solve the problem on orbits and hopefully you can combine the different parts. But what if the group is transitive, if there's only one orbit? Well, uh, you can look at what are called blocks. So what is a block? Uh, these were discovered by, I think, by Wieland. Uh, it was a group th permutation group theorist from the 1950s. So uh, if G is transitive, a subset of G is called a block if it moves as a whole. That means either G maps the block to itself or it moves it fully away from the block. So that means when you apply all the permutations to this block delta, it moves around tiling the domain, uh, which is 1 to n. So it will. So the size of delta must divide n, for example. Um, so a block is non-trivial if the singleton blocks are trivial blocks and the whole of n is also a block and you are interested in non-trivial blocks if you want to divide and conquer. A primitive permutation group is one which does not have non-trivial blocks, otherwise it's called imprimitive. And if you have a non-trivial block, you have a, a block system, namely you, you move the block around and you get a collection of blocks that's called a system of imprimitivity. <coughs> and um, the nice thing which allows you to do, do divide and conquer is that the group acts as a permutation group on the blocks as well, okay? And the total number of blocks is n divided by size of uh, delta. So you have shrunk the domain on which the group is acting by a factor of delta, if you can correctly do the divide and conquer. And the other important fact, of course, is that if delta is a maximal non-trivial block, then G will act primitively on the block system. So the action of G is primitive on the block system. So these are basic facts from permutation group theory, but they are algorithmically useful because the next uh, thing that we're going to do is I'll tell you how uh, Babai formulated the problem and a little bit around that. So given two strings X and Y and a subgroup G of SN, uh, you say the two strings G, X and Y, X and Y are basically bit strings, zeros and ones, and G is a subgroup of SN. So SN is acting on the indices, on the positions so you think of x as x1, x2, xn, where each xi is a bit. y is also y1, y2, yn. What you're asking is by applying an element of the group G, can I permute the positions, the indices of x, so that it becomes equal to y. That's what x to the g uh, means. You're asking is x sub g1, x sub g2, x sub gn equals y1, y2, yn, where g comes from capital G. So in other words, our strings X and Y, G isomorphic. It turns out that you can easily transform graph isomorphism to string isomorphism. How? Because you can think of uh, an n-vertex graph as a bit string of length n choose 2 because it's indexed by the pairs of vertices, unordered pairs of vertices. There are n choose 2 many of them. But the group itself is not the whole of S sub n choose 2. It's Sn seen as a subgroup of S sub n choose 2. And so you are asking if this group G seen as a subgroup of S n choose 2 can map the string corresponding to G1 to the string corresponding to G2. <coughs> so here is an easy case of uh, string isomorphism. Suppose the group G is a billion and you want to know the X and Y are isomorphic. It's very easy to have a divide and conquer solution. How? Well, you first break 1 to n into orbits. There is an easy algorithm for doing it, which I don't have the time to describe. You can very efficiently find the g orbits. And then you can solve the problem orbit by orbit. The reason is that if g is a transitive abelian group on, on omega i, which is the ith orbit, then the total number of elements that g can have is only cardinality omega i because its action has to be regular. If you fix one point, you will fix all the points. So abelian permutation groups are small. 
that is basically the reason on each orbit it has very few elements so you can just project the string x on omega 1 project the string y on omega 1 look for all the elements of g projected on omega 1 there are only cardinality omega 1 of them and find out the ones that map this substring to that substring and that will give you a coset okay and inside this coset you can take on the next orbit and project x to omega 2 y to omega 2 and find out the elements of this coset which is this small because there are only uh, linear many elements in it and find out the sub coset which also preserves the string on omega 2 and so you get an easy algorithm so easy divide and conquer algorithm for abelian groups uh, now let's take on the more general case uh, in the more general case uh, if g is imprimitive what we will do is we will have to find a maximal non-trivial block you can find it ok I can't no time to describe that algorithm once you find a maximal non-trivial block you can find out the entire block system by act, letting g act on it g is given by generators you let its generators move this block and you will get a block system the nice thing is that g's action on this block system is primitive so you have a primitive permutation group what do we know about primitive permutation groups that is an important question which uh, a group theoretic question which we are going to use but the basic divide and conquer strategy is all isomorphisms all g isomorphisms from x to y can be split up as isomorphisms of these so so what is h h is the subgroup of g that set y stabilizes all the blocks it's easy to compute because it's like point y stabilizers <coughs> these blocks behave like points so you can easily compute uh, the subgroup H and H G the union of all H G's and is anyway G so I have just done a very simple divide and conquer strategy which will allow me to recurse into the sub cosets H G where H is the smaller group but the question is how big is this union how many coset representatives are there that depends on the size of G quotient H which acts primitively on this maximal block system so question is how does it help and the point is that suppose G is a soluble group for example then there is a bound due to Babai, Cameron and Palfi which says that all primitive solvable groups are of, on, on n elements are of size at most n to the 4.2 so the union of those cosets that I have written down is actually a small union there are only n to the 4.2 of, of them so this recursion makes sense if I can solve the sub problems then I can easily put them all together hand waving but you can kind of intuitively see where it is going I need to use the fact that primitive permutation groups of certain kinds are small soluble primitive permutation groups are small it turns out that if if G is a permutation group says that all the non abelian composite factors of G are embeddable inside the permutation group S sub L then um, the primitive permutation groups of that kind are all bounded by n to the order L so it is it's a kind of generalization of the soluble case oh, I think the soluble case result was just by Peter Palfi and this general one is by Babai Cameron Palfi I think proved purely for group I mean the graph isomorphism problem that is the reason I think Babai is involved but I do not know for sure uh, and what it gives in the second result it tells you that bounded degree permutation groups have um, can be solved in n to the order L time if L is the degree bounded degree graph bounded degree graph isomorphism where L is a bound on the degree of the graphs can be solved in n to the order L time tournament isomorphism also can be solved efficiently because the automorphism groups of tournaments are uh, solvable the reason is every edge has a direction so uh, automorphism groups of tournaments are odd order groups so by the fight thompson theorem odd order, group, odd order groups are soluble so we know that they are soluble so a nice amount of group theory kind of comes in here to help us get uh, these algorithms by the way for the uh, yeah maybe i should just speed up now uh, the general case <clears throat> so what do we know, know about primitive permutation groups in general uh, 
So here is a very nice theorem of Cameron, which actually builds on a theorem called onan scotts theorem, which classifies all primitive permutation groups. Here, the essential thing that this identifies is that either primitive permutation groups are small, small means they are of size at most n to the constant times log n, or they are giants. Giants means either the alternating group or the entire symmetric group, but not directly acting on 1 to n, but acting on k subsets of some set m and uh, you need to take also a wreath product with uh, another symmetric group SL. So G has structure that is uh, on the one hand, uh, it, it contains the direct product of L copies of the alternating group of M elements, but acting on K, K subsets of 1 to M, the lifted action on K subsets. And it's contained in the wreath product of this big group, which is where G0 is either AM or SN, uh, the wreath product of it with SN. And this theorem is what, uh, for the first case, of course, um, Lux's divide and conquer strategy is enough to give n to the order log n time algorithm for all groups which have only the first kind of primitive sections which can arise in the divide and conquer. And um, Babai's um, algorithm uh, really deals with the second case. So I think that was heavy material, so let me switch on to something lighter. I just thought I'll tell you something about perfect zero knowledge proofs for graph isomorphism. So there is one interesting angle about graph isomorphism where it exhibits behavior um, very different from NP-complete proofs, and that kind of gives evidence that it cannot be NP-complete. So here is one instance. Graph isomorphism has what is called perfect zero-knowledge proofs. I'll explain in a minute what it means. Uh, NP-complete problems, on the other hand, also have zero-knowledge proofs, but they have only computationally zero-knowledge proofs. In fact, they cannot have perfect zero-knowledge proofs unless uh, the polynomial time hierarchy collapses or some unlikely consequence happens. Okay, um, so, so there's a more lighter slide after the group theory. So uh, this is the model where in which we're working. The figure on the left is called Arthur, and the one on the right is the wise wizard called Merlin. And they're communicating over a channel which is insecure, so there is an eavesdropper on the channel. And Arthur, you can imagine, is somebody who is a user of a system and he is trying to convince Merlin that he is a legal user and he wants to log in. And uh, so Arthur has to convince Merlin that he is authentic, but he should not reveal any other information than the fact that he is authentic. So authenticity without compromising privacy. So zero knowledge proofs, for example, in blockchain technology in today is are, are very much back in vogue. They are a very important tool in blockchains. So the idea is that the eavesdropper should be able to see only random noise on the channel. So it's, it's a probability distribution that he could have generated himself. So in that sense, it is zero knowledge. Perfect zero knowledge means the distribution that is generated is identical to the distribution that is in the communication between Arthur and Merlin. Uh, computational zero knowledge means that a polynomial time adversary cannot see any difference between the two. So NP-complete problems have only computational zero knowledge proofs. So I'm just going to describe that uh, computationally zero knowledge proof for an NP-complete problem and leave the perfect one for graph isomorphism as X size for those interested or for the students, sorry, because I have not made a slide on it. And so here is a graph which is three colorable. Why is it three colorable? Here is a three coloring for it, red, blue, and yellow, okay. So it's a graph on 11 vertices and it's three colorable. So what does it mean to say that it's three colorable? You want to color the vertices properly. That means any two adjacent vertices have different colors. So we used colors in a different sense when we talked to Weisfeiler Lehman. Here it's a different sense. Okay. So this is known as proper coloring of graphs. 
So three coloring problem is given a graph is a three colorable, it's a well-known NP-complete problem. So Arthur wants to convince Merlin that the graph that he has is a three colorable graph and he knows a three coloring for it. So how does he convince Merlin that it's a three colorable graph? What he does, so this is the three coloring, what he does is he randomly permutes all the 12 vertices, so 0 to 11, sorry, there are 12 vertices, randomly permute all the 12 vertices, okay, and color the vertices but put the colors inside digital envelopes. So imagine that these boxes around the vertices, the colors are inside digital envelopes. What does a digital envelope mean? It means that Arthur has committed to the coloring because he sent the envelope, but Merlin cannot open the envelope unless he has the right key, okay? So if there are one-way functions, you can create these digital envelopes. So uh, he sends this colored graph where the colors are inside digital envelopes to Merlin, and Merlin can pick any pair of vertices which are adjacent and say that open these two envelopes, I want to see that the colors are different. Or he doesn't trust Arthur that Arthur may have sent a permutation of a totally different graph and not th this particular graph. And because Merlin uh, wants to know if Arthur is trying to cheat like that, he can ask for that permutation to be revealed and then Arthur can repeat the experiment also. So the point of this is that uh, you can, uh, it's, it's a complicated proof to prove that it's a computationally zero knowledge proof. The amount of information that is leaked is can be leaked, but it's a very small amount of information. And Merlin can, with high probability, uh, detect if author is not a valid, not a legal user. Okay. And just a one slide description. For graph isomorphism, perfect zero knowledge proofs don't rely on digital envelopes. And they, they use the fact that there is a permutation group acting on the vertices. And that is enough to get a, a zero knowledge proof. Okay, <clears throat> the next slide was meant to be something on counting complexity. Again, a property that exhibits a difference to, I'll take uh, maybe two, three more minutes and wind up. Um, so, counting problems are uh, notoriously hard for NP-complete problems. If you want to count the number of three colorings which are uh, proper colorings for a graph, that comes from a class that is much harder than NP-complete. Okay, so much harder I'm not quantifying here. But on the other hand, graph isomorphism exhibits a totally different behavior. So for example, you can prove that graph isomorphism is powerless as subroutine for the complexity class PP. And this was a result that was prone, uh, shown by Kobler, Schoening, and Toran. Johannes Kobler is sitting right here in the audience. And um, uh, there is a strengthening of that result where you can show that it's even powerless as oracle for modular counting classes. It's in the class, uh, what is called SPP, stoic PP. No time to describe it. The nice thing is that this last result is in the PhD thesis of Piyush Kurur from IMSE. So. And uh, finally, um, something about graph neural networks that I promised right in the beginning. So what are graph neural networks? Graph neural networks are neural networks for processing, are machine learning um, objects, machine learning neural networks for processing data that have an inherent graph structure, okay, a graph representation. And they are designed to have the property of permutation invariance in them. <coughs> So what do neural networks look like? They have layers of perceptrons. Perceptrons are basically uh, threshold functions. They are linear functions of the gates which are coming from below. So you should imagine a neural network as something that is very large but very flat with a few layers of perceptrons. But in each layer, there are many, many perceptrons, okay? And these threshold functions are designed to have this permutation invariance property because you want, that's why they're called graph neural networks. And there are three kinds of uh, weighted uh, threshold functions. They're called convolutional, attentional, and message passing. 
The surprising thing is that all three of them are captured by Weisweiler Lehman. So that's why I thought Weisweiler Lehman strikes back. It was invented in the 1960s and even today it is kind of relevant. So, uh, so here is a, a, a paper that is assuming importance, the multi-author paper in which Gaurav, who was our own PhD student, and he was working in Martin Grohe's group in Aachen, where they found this connection between Weisweiler Lehman and uh, graph neural networks. And uh, there are more papers by them. And uh, so it is turning out that uh, the neural networks people, especially those who are designing graph neural networks, are getting more and more interested in Weisweiler Lehman based algorithms and uh, higher dimensional Weisweiler Lehman. The block there is they want their, their networks are huge and they want, so the higher dimensional neural networks are simply, because the graphs they are looking at are so large, uh, n to the k for k dimensional uh, Weisweiler Lehman is something too prohi prohibitive for them because n is too large for them. So they are trying to figure out workarounds of it. And there is an interesting upcoming book which discusses all these things titled Geometric Deep Learning. Uh, where Weisweiler Lehman and graph neural networks are described. So it's a hot area of research. So I'll stop with this. So I would just end with saying that graph isomorphism has a nice story as background and there is more to come in future. Thank you. Are there any questions? I'm happy to take them. Talk, sir. Uh, I just had a small, uh, perhaps naive uh, question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the algorithms executing Weisfarer Lyman uh, are not really good oracular uh, uh, functions for uh, some sort of problems. Uh, and uh, I was just wondering if we can actually connect uh, the problem of graph isomorphism to, say, uh, using oracles in a more general sense, say, finding hidden subgroups for a particular type of class. Finding what? Finding hidden subgroups to finding determine if subgroup. f oh. hides a subgroup of a group. The hidden subgroup problem. Yeah. I see. Uh, yeah, I think it's not. It, so the kind of group theory that arises from what I remember from quantum algorithms, that's where you're interested in, right? Uh, yeah. So if you're coming from quantum algorithms, uh, hidden subgroup problems, firstly, the kind of groups you are looking at are essentially either matrix groups or you know, highly number theoretic groups, where you know, if you want to interpret them as permutation groups, the domain on which it will act will be enormous. Yeah. Okay? So that is, for example, the reason why for permutation groups, um, uh, membership testing in permutation groups is very easy. If I give you a permutation, and a subgroup of SN generated by a bunch of permutation, it's, uh, you can very efficiently find out mm. if this is a member of that group. Right. Whereas in the case of uh, matrix groups, or even in the case of the cyclic group Z mod P, right. uh, where P is a large prime number, mm. and I give you a generator of that cycling group, mm. and I give you an element and I want to find the exponent. Mm. Uh, I want to find the element x says that a to the x equals b mod p, for example, where a is the generator. Mm -hmm. um, that problem can be solved efficiently using quantum algorithms, but there is no efficient classical al algorithm known for it. Be because you can't, whereas on the other hand, so this is a membership testing problem, mm -hmm. but not for permutation groups. The okay. prime p is very large, so it also tells us that uh, it's very unlikely, I, I don't know whether you can outright prove that uh, in t yeah, I think you can even outright prove that uh, Z mod P cannot be embedded inside SN uh, unless N has that prime factor P sitting inside it. Okay. So, so the base has to be large. Okay. So I don't think those techniques are relevant for the... Uh, okay. So maybe, but I just wanted to make one comment in that connection, uh, not maybe not directly in that connection, but in a more general connection. Right. 
the fact that weiss filo lehman does not solve the graph isomorphism is seen as a strength in the neural networks community because often you don't want to check you know you know when you for example when you go to patent a molecule obviously you will not replicate or in the pharma pharma pharm, pharmacological community i don't know so if you create a new drug molecule you will not replicate the same existing drug molecule you will add a few things which will not change the behavior of the drug but which will make it look different from the drug so it's not isomorphic to any existing thing in the database but yet with the human eye a chemist will immediately know that oh you have copied it from this and maybe added these features or something so you want a technique that will be not solving graph isomorphism exactly but even if it roughly matches you should be able to detect that and uh, k dimensional weiss filo lehman for higher values of k seems to do that okay so it can solve graph similarity problems not just isomorphism problems but not connected to the hidden subgroup problem Okay, I mean those watching the talk in YouTube can. Sivashish has a question. Question in the chat. Oh, Sivashish had a question. Yeah, this is a naive question. Uh, what about isomorphism of hypergraphs? Will it come in the? Uh, hypergraphs in general are are easy because you can always represent a hypergraph as a you as a bipartite graph. You put edges on the other side and vertices on the other side and think of hyper edges as. you know it's a point on the other side and everything that 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 hyper edge contains you put edges to that okay. so but then the group that is acting is on both the vertices and the edges so if you want a group that is acting only on the vertices of a special kind you know suppose i give you a subgroup of sn and i give you two hypergraphs and ask are these two hypergraphs g isomorphic mm -hmm. then maybe you are asking uh, uh, can you solve it efficiently yes if g is solvable and all those uh, group theoretic techniques can can be applied for that as well but slightly different techniques okay thanks so did you mean to say bipartite graph isomorphism is easy no bipartite graph isomorphism i didn't say it's easy okay. hypergraphs is obviously harder than graphs right. i said you can easily represent hypergraphs as graphs and always reduce hypergraph isomorphism to graph isomorphism, to graph isomorphism. but a defect there is that the number of vertices is now large right so if you're also given a group it may, it's not the right way to proceed but bipartite graphs is is as, as hard, hard as, as yeah. even chordal graph isomorphism is as hard as graph i have a very nice question so when people look at chemical compounds they usually also uh, categorize them at discrete groups they belong to different discrete groups now that group is probably a different yeah these are different not, uh, not the, no uh, those are also like oh you mean no, yeah. the the oh, uh, the, the stereo uh, you mean uh, rotation groups yeah 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 so many of see, these are the, see the thing is that you um, but uh, so i think the topological cipher that i mentioned right at okay. the beginning the morgan cipher mm -hmm. uses uh, that rep, but it since the the molecule itself is going to have Uh, say some ten atoms, or it's made out of maybe hundred atoms, and with bonds between them. Even though the action is uh, uh, three-dimensional rotation, rotations, or whatever rigid rotations you might do, um, it still you can think of it as a subgroup of S hundred. Okay, so computationally, um, if you can take advantage of the fact that it comes from the, the orthogonal group structure. uh then maybe you can do something i don't know i don't know what, um that angle of it how to exploit that but th maybe there are um okay we can discuss it separately thank you thank you <coughs> so i have a question you mentioned some evidence is why it's unlikely to be np complete the counting the counting behavior and perfect zero knowledge pr proof would you also say two power log cube then is another evidence yeah, yeah, that's right <laughs> but that's of course more recent yeah that's true yeah that's obviously yeah. that i was looking at more structural right. complexity kind of evidence but that obviously is the big evidence okay so if there are no more questions we thank arvind again